All right, everyone, welcome. Welcome to tonight's The Late Night, which topic is Antarctica. We're very excited to be here with you tonight. Uh, and in the next couple of minutes, Ria and I are going to get you through our trivia. So welcome. And uh, please find a comfortable space around your house and uh, maybe get some paper and pencils so you can uh, tally your score. But here we go. We're starting. And now we're going to talk about Arctic versus Antarctic. And if you want to play with us tonight, you should go to www.menti.com and enter a digit code. Four six seven zero two one zero six. With this code, you're going to be able to uh, answer the responses, and we can see your live response. If you have any trouble with that, just you can put them in the chat, or you can tally them at home. And uh, in the end, uh, you will be able to see how well do you do tonight. Uh, if you have a cell phone nearby, or your parents have a cell phone. You can scan this, core, this QR code and that will take you directly to the link of menti.com. All right. So are you ready? Is everybody ready? Are you ready, Ria? I'm ready. Okay, so let's start. Question number one of tonight's trivia is this polar area consists of land sur surrounded by an ocean. A, Antarctica, B, the Arctic, C, both, or D, neat neither. What do you think? So far, we're at an even split, but I think we're getting some more people joining, so we have some more answers coming in now. Okay. And so think about it. Which area consists of the land surrounded by the ocean? Okay, so it looks like it's still a tie between. <laughs> uh, okay, I think just by one vote. Yes. Most people have said A for Antarctica, and the second popular answer was for C, both. Okay, so let's see this. And the correct answer is Antarctica. In contrast, the Arctic consists of an ocean surrounded by land. So if you look at the picture, you can see down here the land for Antarctica, and then the ocean is around it. In this case, you see Greenland, Alaska here, Russia. So it's an ocean surrounded by land. That's the difference, okay? So good job. By one vote, our audience got the right answer and is Antarctica. Let's go to question number two. Question number two says, this polar area experiences six months of darkness followed by six months of light each year. A, Antarctica, B, the Arctic, C, both, or D, neither. How are we doing there? Oh, yeah, we're still getting some votes and people are still putting their answers. Okay. And it seems like the most pop. Oh, wait another minute. Okay. Okay, so the most popular answer is A for Antarctica and then by one vote less, B for the Arctic. Okay. So one or the other, huh? So let's see. What's the right answer? So it's actually both, right? You think of the location, they're both at the opposite ends of the planet. And uh, these occurs because the Earth is tilted on its axis by 23 degrees. And the North and South Poles, the sun only rises and sets once per year. So whenever it's sunny on one side, it's dark on the other. And then uh, when the seasons shift, then it's the other way around. So um, they actually in both uh, parts of the planet, uh, they would experience six months of light or six months of darkened on the opposite, right? 
Uh, and you have here a beautiful picture of the midnight sun. Let's go to question number two. This polar area is the windiest place on earth. Where do you think we get the strongest wind of, on earth? Antarctica, the Arctic, both or neither? Rating on uh, two more people to put in their answers. It's a tie between three of the answers so far. So I'm waiting for that one person <laughs> to make their decision, maybe break that tie between three options. All right. Okay, well, there's an even tie um, with A for Antarctica, C for both, and D for neither. All right. You know, my uh, my instinct was neither because I was like, oh, that it's maybe it's in in the Caribbean where the hurricane season is, where we have the windiest place on Earth. But actually, it's a Antarctica. On average, Antarctica is the windiest continent on the planet Earth, and in some places, wind speeds can reach up to two hundred miles per hour, which equals uh, probably a, uh, uh, a strong uh, hurricane uh, wind. So it, it's actually, I was not that far back for my answer, but actually it happens in the Antarctica. It is part of their normal weather over there. And you can see here the picture of how that wind is blowing. Let's go to question number four. Millions of people live in this polar area. A, Antarctica, B, the Arctic, C, both, or D, neither. Where do we have millions of people living? Okay, so it was really close, um, but the top answer was the Arctic for B. All right. And you guys are correct. We have about 4 million people living in permanently in the Arctic. But if we think about Antarctica, they have no permanent residents. Only visiting scientists or tourists will be considered Antarctica's residents. But they don't live the year, live year there all year round, right? They come and go, uh, and there's no government, and it's not even considered a country, right? So uh, the answer was B for the Arctic. Question number five: Seals and whales live in this polar area. A Antarctica, B the Arctic, C both, or D neither. I see some answers in the chat. Okay, so it looks like a lot of people put the answer for C, both. For C, both, all right. And that is correct. Many whale species migrate to polar areas in the summer to feed on the abundant food sources, such as the krill, and they can go either north or south. So we have uh, seals and whales in on the Arctic and in Antarctica as well. Good job, guys. Now, if you just joined us and you were a little late uh, for the questions, here are the instructions again. We're doing a trivia night in the Arctic versus the Antarctic. And to play, you go to www.menti.com 
and you enter the eight digital code 46702106, or you can QR, scan the QR here, code here, and that will take you directly to the Menti website. Okay, we are, um, this is only five out of 20 questions that we have for you. So um, log in and we will continue. Question number six, the environment of this polar area is protected. That's Antarctica, the Arctic, both or neither places. So far, it's like a really close tie. So I'm going to wait for a few more votes to come in. Okay. Wow. Almost every question has been a tie tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just by one vote, um, people have said C or yeah. Okay. By now by two, two votes by C for both. Okay. So let's see. Actually, is A, Antarctica. The Arctic is, is not, I mean, some areas might be protected, but it's not, the whole environment is not considered protected. But unlike the Arctic, all plants and animals in, our, in Antarctica are also under the Antarctic Treaty system. And this protects um, the land, right? The land of Antarctica from being colonized or from, uh, been practicing um, uh, military exercises that will destroy the habitat. So it's completely protected and they only have researchers and scientists in there for the purposes of studying the area. And I think, I believe this treaty uh, is has been in place since 1961. So question number seven. Polar bears live in this polar area. So where do you think polar bears are native from? To Antarctica or the Arctic? Or both? Okay, so the most popular answer and it's still going is for B, the Arctic. And that is correct. Polar bears are the largest species of bear in the world and they only live in the Arctic. Although if it keeps melting, they might move out, right? <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, so we have here a family of bears and we're going to go next to question number eight. Penguins live in this polar area. Where do you think penguins live? Antarctica, the Arctic, or both? It so looks like a lot of people have said A for Antarctica. And you guys are experts. That is correct. Penguins live in Antarctica and almost all penguins live south of the equator. Uh, so the northernmost penguin species is in the Galapagos Islands, the Galapagos penguins. And um, that is near at the equator, right? So they, they live in the South Pole. Um, and almost all the 18 living species of penguins uh, are there. All right, so let's go question number nine. There are active volcanoes in this polar area, Antarctica, the Arctic, or both? Where do you think there are active volcanoes? C, 
so I was almost an even split between three answers. Um, but the most popular answer was for D, neither. And then the second was B for the Arctic. The Arctic or neither. Huh? So actually, C, both. There are active volcanoes in the Arctic and in Antarctica. And there are currently two active volcanoes in Antarctica and five within the Arctic Circle. And there's a volcano erupting in Iceland, so you should check out videos and uh, images of that because it's very cool. <laughs> yes. Question number 10. This polar area is classified as a desert. Do you think it's Antarctica, the Arctic, both, or neither? Can we have a desert in any of these places? It looks like a lot of people put down A for Antarctica. Okay, let's see. And that is correct. The dry valleys of Antarctica are the driest place on the planet. This area has not had rain in almost 2 million years. And you can see here an aerial view of those valleys. And again, if you just join us, uh, here is our uh, link to the menti.com, www.menti.com. If you put the um, a digit code 46702106, you can log in to, uh, to this page and Ria will be able to see your live response. If you had trouble with it, just keep putting it in the chat. I am monitoring the chat as well. And we hope you're enjoying this. Let's continue. Question number 11, dog sledding is a popular activity in this polar area. Where do you go for dog sledding? Antarctica, the Arctic, both or neither? Okay, so it looks like most people said B for the Arctic. All right, and that is correct. Dogs were officially outlawed in Antarctica in 1994 because there were concerns that they could spread diseases over the native wildlife. And actually, um, I, I assume if, if a lot of people were familiar with it, if you look at all the traveling brochures for Alaska, they usually have you in the north, right, in the Arctic, uh, going for uh, dog sledding. I've done it before. It's super cool. And those are super strong Alaskan Huskies in that picture that they can take you anywhere. So uh, let's go to the next question. Question number 12. These polar area holds most of the world's fresh water. What do you think is that? Antarctica, the Arctic, both or neither? Where is the most of the world's fresh water. Looks like most people are, I think it's changing, hold on. Oh no, it's a tie again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait is. for another minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's still a tie. So um, it's a tie between Antarctica, the Arctic, and now it's the, t it's the tie is becoming between Antarctica, the Arctic, and both. Okay, all right. So actually, I think naturally people will think the Arctic because there's an, like it's the ocean right in the center, so there's more water, but he says fresh water. So actually it is a, a Antarctica. Antarctica contains about 70% of Earth fresh water and about 90% of Earth's total ice volume. All right, so question number 13, walruses live in this polar area. 
A, Antarctica, B, the Arctic, C, both, or D, neither? It looks like most of the answers are coming in for B, the Arctic. All right, and you guys are experts. That is correct. Walruses only live in the Arctic and subarctic regions of the world near the North Pole. Question number 14. You can see auroras like the northern lights in this polar area. Antarctica, the Arctic, both or neither. Okay, so we have an over overwhelming response for B, the Arctic. Okay, for B, the Arctic. And I think it's because it says northern lights, right? But actually, you can see the aurora around the North Pole, and it's called the Aurora Borealis. But then we also can see the aurora near the South, Pacific, South Pole, and it's called the Aurora Australis. So it's less common, I guess, because it's, it's harder to access, right? But uh, you can see these kind of lights in both uh, points of the planet, north and south. Question number 15. This polar area is a good place to find well-preserved meteorites. Antarctica, the Arctic, both or neither. We are going to have an overwhelming response for A, Antarctica. All right. And you guys are correct. And actually, our very own uh, rocker scientist, Dr. Julianne Gross, uh, she spent eight weeks in Antarctica uh, in 2017, and she was actually searching for meteorites there. Uh, and she will actually be our speaker uh, or guest presenter in our next late night, which is, it will be May 5th. So you can see he, her here in the picture and here's a meteorite that she found. So we're very proud of her. And uh, we're gonna move on into the last section of questions here, but I wanted to remind you that if you came in late, you can log in to www.menti.com and enter the eight digit code 4670 2106 or scan the QR code here and uh, answer the, the last final five questions that we have for you tonight before we move on into the craft. So let's go on to question number 16. What is the average thickness of Antarctica's ice? 100 feet, 1,000 feet, one mile, or 10 miles? Okay, so it's like we have most of our uh, answers for C, which is one mile. All right. Then, uh, yes, that's correct. Well, the average is one mile. The thickest part of Antarctica's ice sheet is almost three miles. And I think that's what is was hard for people to visualize maybe a volcano. So you just think of a block of ice. Uh, but there are volcanoes in Antarctica, and there is a one mile thick of ice across and in some areas it could go up to three miles. Question number 17. What is the largest permanent land inhabitant of, our, of Antarctica? A penguin, polar bear, arctic hare, or an insect? What is the largest permanent land inhabitant? It looks like most of people are answering for a penguin. So this was a tricky question. And let me tell you guys, I also got it wrong. Uh, I thought it was penguins, but actually the largest land animal living in Antarctica is a wingless fly called the Belgica Antarctica. 
And uh, so all the other larger animals are considering are considered marine life. And as marine animals, that means that they come to they may come to the land and feed, uh, but they live most most of their life in the ocean. And I think a lot of the penguins they also uh, swim to the like sub Antarctic uh, islands and they they live back and forward. But this insect actually lives in Antarctica and uh, all its life, right? It doesn't go somewhere else and come back. It's just a permanent land inhabitant of the, uh, Antarctica. Uh, so I hope you learned something new tonight because you're doing really good. Uh, question number 18, what is the coldest temperature ever recorded in Antarctica? Zero degrees Fahrenheit, minus 49 degrees Fahrenheit, 99 degrees Fahrenheit or mi minus um, 129 degrees Fahrenheit. It looks like there's a lot of answers for D, minus 129 degrees Fahrenheit. You see guys, you're expert, you're correct. Uh -huh. So, this is the, also the coldest temperature ever recorded on planet Earth, and it was actually measured at Antarctica's Boscot weather station on July 21 of 1983. So 30-something years ago. And you have here a picture of the station. Super cold. All right, so question number 19, we're getting close to the end here, but how many researchers and research stations are there in Antarctica? How many research st stations there are in Antarctica? A, 30, B, 55, C, 70, or D, 100? So, so far, it's pretty close between all of the answers. Um, hmm, let's see. It's a tie. <laughs> so, <laughs> not a tie anymore. So, the first answer most popular was B, 55, and the second most popular is D for five or for 100. For 100, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, guys, it's, it's actually right in the middle of your answer. Is uh, There are currently 70 permanent research stations scattered across Antarctica, and there are 29 countries representing, and all the continents are represented. You can see the map here on where these stations are. And again, uh, these are research stations, so it's, it's not a place where people necessarily live forever. They may come for a season or they may come for uh, some time, but they are not residents of Antarctica. Um, how many species of penguins live in Antarctica? A1, B5, C9 or D15? So we have a tie again, and it's between B and D, B for five, and then D for 15. Okay, okay, let's see here. So actually five, You half of the group had it right. Uh, there are a total of 18 species of penguins. I think I mentioned that before, but only five live in Antarctica. There are another four species that live in the sub Antarctic islands as well. So that's good. Um, now, this was our last question of the night. So this is time for you to uh, tally your score and then uh, see if you got from zero to 10 questions correct. You are a good geographer. If you got between 11 and 15 questions right, you're a polar biologist. But if you got between 16 and 20 answers correct, you are an Antarctic specialist. So let us know in the chat who you are. Do your tally and let us know who, what kind of scientist you are tonight, okay? Thank you for playing. It's been my pleasure and Ria's pleasure to uh, be here with you tonight. And I am going to turn off my camera shortly, but I'm going to pass it down to Ria because it's time for our ice core craft. 
So it's uh, once you do your tally and you let us know what kind, what scientist you are tonight, you're going to need to uh, find your supplies, right? Look for a narrow drinking glass, vase tube, salt, sugar, black pepper, and optional, if you have a funnel or a spoon nearby, bring it over and Ria will guide you through our activity. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. So I just have, um, before we do the activity, I just have a few things I wanted to tell you all about, just a little bit of background information about ice cores. Um, but you can definitely, while I'm talking, you can grab your supplies. So like Patty said, you'll need narrow drinking glass or a vase or a tube. So I have a little jar like this, so it's perfect. It doesn't have to be big. Um, get some salt and sugar and black pepper. And if you want, you can use a spoon or if you have a funnel, that would be pretty useful too, because you don't want to spill the sugar and stuff all over the place, just in case, right? Um, and so, Patty, could you advance to the next slide? Thank you. So we're talking about scores, right, in glacial ice. So how do glaciers even form, right? So if you think about, we we're talking a lot about Antarctica and the Arctic. So in these places, it's really cold. So it's the precipitation there, it snows a lot. And so as it snows, this layers of snow um, every year, right? There's annual snow layers and you have like snow, you have more snow and snow and snow. So every time it snows, that snow just adds up um, and it builds up an ice sheet and it gets compressed over a long time. Um, and that's how we form these really, really thick ice sheets from snow. And so these snow crystals, you can see in the picture there, right? That's what a really pretty snow crystal looks like. Um, they have really amazing shapes and different structures. And all of that depends on how the atmosphere atmospheric condition is. So if it's a moist or warm condition, then you get those really nice, big, fluffy snowflakes. Um, and that would be like summer snow. Um, and then if it's like a colder area, like dry conditions, then this, you'll get really small and thin flakes. So it really depends on these atmosphere, atmospheric conditions. And uh, Patty, could you go to the next slide? Okay, so again, here you can see in the picture. So we go from, so for glacier ice formation, we go from a really pretty snowflake and then here you have granular snow, right? So as it's getting pressed down, because you have so many layers of snow on top of it, the layers at the bottom, it starts to compress and there's it's really heavy. So it um, all of that compresses and all there's a high pressure. So it compacts, right? So at first you might have loose air spaces in between the snow, but as you're compressing and adding more weight on top, it pushes down and it starts to, um, these grains start to turn into ice. So they go, turn into granular snow, and then they turn into something called fern, um, because there is repeated melting and refreezing. Um, so as it melts and refreezes again, it'll turn into fern. And then as it compresses more, then the larger crystals will form the glacial ice. And so this can take 30 to 40 years for snow to actually form into this dense glacial ice. Um, maybe you've seen pictures of it where it's like really pretty, like blue, right? A really nice blue kind of blue ice kind of uh, thing. Maybe you've seen pictures of that. Um, and so the this is how glacial ice forms. And so um, the next slide. And so this is really important because, like I said, as it snows, we actually have a record, um, an annual record of every year. So you might be more familiar with tree rings, right? And if you count the tree rings, uh, you can actually figure out the age of a tree, right? You can also find out a lot of information about a climate from tree rings. In the middle picture, we have something called lake barbs. So just like how I was talking about the snow, how it builds up every year, you can also look at the layers in a lake from the sediments. They also have this banding um, and then the colors also mean something different too, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So the lighter colors and darker colors, you can look at the variations. And the one on the right side of that picture, so that's from an ice core, right? So that is that glacial ice. And I'll explain on the, the next slide, um, which Patty will show you all. Okay, so here we have, um, these are actual scientists that are working with ice cores. These ice cores are super, super cold. 
and you want to make sure that they don't melt because if they melt then um, you lose your record right so they are working basically in a giant freezer and they have this light under um, by the table so that they can see and they're counting on they're counting all of those little layers and studying the layers in the ice and it's a cool job okay next slide Okay, so here are a few facts about tree rings and ice cores. So the tree rings I mentioned, there's a difference in the color. So the, when you see a lighter color, that means that growth was happening during spring or summertime, and the dark growth would be in the late summer and fall. So together, a light band and a dark band would be one year, right? Because those are the representing two different seasons. Uh, when you have really wide rings, that's when it was really, really rainy, rose rainfall was really high. And if the rings are really narrow, then it was there was low rainfall. So that's really helpful. And then the inner rings tend to be wider than the outer rings. And so for those for tree rings and for ice cores, similarly, the light rings in an ice core would also form during the spring and summer snowfall. Um, and then the dark rings are during the fall and winter. So again, together, if you look at a light and a dark, that would be one year. Um, and so the wide layers here would occur when there's a lot of snowfall, right? When there's really high snowfall, narrow, narrow ones are during low snowfall years. And the layers near the surface, at, like near at the top, tend to be a lot wider. Um, and the layers deep under the surface are more narrow because they've been pushed down and compressed. And at the bottom, you'll find that glacial ice. Okay, and so just as counting tree rings, right? You can also uh, do that for ice core rings, but it, you know, it is a very tedious and long and hard process. So scientists definitely have to um, you talk to other scientists about their results so that they know that they're they have an accuracy. Uh, next slide, Patty. Okay, so now we are actually going to make our ice core. So um, you should have sugar. And so our sugar will be representing when we have this coarse summer snow. Uh, you should have salt. And the salt is going to represent the fine, finer snow during the winter, a winter layer. And again, together, the salt and sugar, right? So the, that, or the dark and the light band would make one year. Um, and then the pepper, if you have black pepper, that is going to be representing volcanic ash because in ice cores, a lot of things also get trapped, like gas bubbles, like carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere. We also have, like I said, ash, volcanic ash can get trapped inside of the ice cores too. If a volcanic eruption happened nearby, um, that can get into it, as well as pollen. So anything in the air, so pollen is really lightweight, it's in the air. There's even dust. Dust also gets trapped in ice cores and pollen can also be found in ice cores as well. So for our purposes today, we are using the black pepper to represent volcanic ash, since we will pretend we're near a volcanic area. Um, and I think I, you can stop sharing now, Patty. I have my camera. So I can show you all how to do this. So, and yes, I think someone was asking in the chat if you could use a cup. You can definitely use a cup. Maybe try to use a clear cup so that you could see the sides so that you can count your layers. Okay, so I'm gonna get my camera here. I have my supplies. And again, if you wanna use a... Hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. So I was just saying I got all my supplies. I have my jar, I have my black pepper, I have my salt, and I also have my sugar. Um, so I'm going to start by putting some sugar into this layer here. And yes, Jonathan, you can use a cup. I don't know if you heard me before, but you can definitely use a cup. So here's my layer. Now we're gonna put some more sugar in here. Okay, and now I think I'm going to add some salt. It's okay if you don't have, um, if you don't have like uh, fine salt, if you have like sea salt, or even if you have like 
if you don't have regular sugar, you can use brown sugar. You can use anything you'd like. And you will see a little color difference. It might be hard to see on the camera, but you would be able to see the difference. And I'll show you. Maybe I'll put the jar on and show this to you. So far, this is what I have. So I have two layers so far. I'm going to add some pepper for my volcanic eruption. There's my volcanic ash layer. I'm going to add more sugar. So here's my other layer. So here's a new year now. Because remember, the salt and sugar make up one year. And you just might sneeze from all that pepper. I'm going to make some more volcanic ash. I'm going to get some more sugar, have another year. Oh, Jonathan, you eat pepper daily. That's nice. You like pepper? I like pepper too. All right, I'm almost at the top of my jar. So I'm just going to add another volcanic ash layer here. That's a big one that I added. And I'll add the last year for me, for my jar, but you can definitely fill it up more if you want. And here's my last year. Okay. So once you're done, you can count how many layers your ice core is showing, and you can share the answer with us in the chat. So I'm going to switch my camera and show you what mine looks like. Here's mine. So you can see I have one, two, three, four. I have my core is just representing four years. Because remember, you have the summer, summer snow and you have winter snow, and that would represent one year. And so I can see the color change between the sugar and the salt, but um, you might be able to see it clear on your end. It's a little hard to see for mine. And the black pepper are these volcanic ash layers. There is my little ice core. And take you can definitely take pictures. Maybe we can, um, Patty, we can share the slide back up with the Padlet. So you guys can take pictures and you can show your creations. You can share it and upload it on the Padlet. And we can see what your ice cores look like. All right, so let me see if you guys, I will share. Let's see if you put anything up there. I can share it with you all. Let's see what you made. Oh, I see a lot of cool ones. Hey, Julie, if you give me um, sharing privileges, I can show everyone the Padlet. Thank you. Yeah, I was trying to open it, but you had it first. <laughs> That's okay, got it. All right, so here's a real ice core in the first picture over here from the field. And here are some real ice core layers here. You can see the, the different, the banding here. Looks like Thorne made a really nice ice core with salt, pepper, sugar, and salt. And then here's one. Oh, it's a really nice drawing. Yeah, and if you didn't want to use or if you didn't have supplies, you could definitely draw and you can upload it onto the Padlet. This is a really nice drawing. I like this one. Matt, good job. And yeah, so once you guys are finishing up your creations, definitely upload them onto the Padlet. The QR code is right here. So you can just scan that and you can add it here. And we'd love to see that. You can also, if you post it on social media, don't forget to tag us. We're the Rutgers Geology Museum. 
All right, so I think, okay, Sophia has seven layers is awesome. So I think we are ready uh, for our guest speaker now. Bridget, are you here? I am. Okay, perfect. So, oh. so I'll it off to you, Bridget. You can, so today our guest speaker is Bridget Ward and she will be telling you all about the awesome work that she does. So without further ado, go ahead, Bridget, and you can get started. Well, thank you, Rhea, for this awesome craft. You can see I had uh, two volcanic eruptions in my, my climate. So that came out really cool. I'm gonna show that with my students. I am going to just take a second and share the screen. Well, thank you everyone for coming uh, today or tonight, or depending on where you're coming from and where you're located. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me well. It looks like it. Uh, my name is Bridget Ward and I'm a Polar Trek teacher. Um, so I actually do teach uh, as my full time job. I'm a high school biology and ecology teacher in Massachusetts. And Polar Trek is a awesome program that hooks up teachers with polar scientists and sends us with research teams to either arctic or antarctica every year um, except for obviously this last year due to the pandemic but my project is called growing up on ice and i work with Weddell seals and uh you could see a little pup in the image there, and that's me. I, I know that we learned about so many bases today at in Antarctica, but I actually worked at McMurdo Station. So the name of our project is Growing Up on Ice, and we study the early development of Weddell seal pups. So we're on the ice, we're trying to figure out when they are born Unfortunately, we've never seen, like, I've never seen one born. It's really hard to catch one being born. We were like minutes late one day, um, but it, it's, they're so cute. This is the research team I worked with. Uh, we're a seven woman team and we have Heather Luanig, Linnea Pearson, Heather Harris, Emily Whitmer, Emma Weitzner, Aaron Brody and myself, and we're also known as Team Bravo 030. And the team itself is out of Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo and the Marine Mammal Center. And that's going to make much more sense in a second. Uh, so everyone on a research team has a really important role, and it's a special role. Uh, so Starting on the left side, we have Dr. Linnea Pearson. She's a co-principal investigator. She's kind of, uh, she's one of our two leaders. Erin uh, Brody is next. She's a veterinarian technician. Uh, Dr. Heather Luanig is, she's our principal investigator. Again, she's from Cal Poly. That's where she teaches full time. Then there's me. I'm a Polar Trek teacher, educator. Emma Weitzer was a graduate student. She's working on her doctorate. Uh, and then we had two field veterinarians, Heather Harris and Emily Whitmer. And that's all of us just one day down in McMurdo station sign. But a team is so much more. It takes so many people to come together and support a research team when it's in the field. So here's some other members, uh, other people that have actually been down in Antarctica because it's a multi-year project. Uh, we have Lars, Sean, Sophia, or Sophie, and Melissa. And then we have the Brewster brothers that build our tools that we use down in the field. So even if the, they're not in the field that year with us, uh, since this is a multi-year investigation, they are so important. Another team we want to thank is Bravo 009. Uh, they've been about 30 years working down in Antarctica, uh, right on the Ross sea ice shelf where we work. And they go ahead and tag every seal pup that is born with that little tag so we can correctly identify them because though they're cute, it is hard to tell them apart. 
So uh, thank you to Bravo 009. And there was a link to their website. If you want to see any of their data, they're a very hardworking team. They actually will sleep out on the ice. It's kind of amazing. So Antarctica, right? How do you even get down there? So usually there's one of two ways to get down there. You can actually take a ship from the South South America tip and go across Drake's Passage and end up in Antarctica. But what I did is I flew. It did not have to get seasick on a ship. So I took a C-17, that plane is right behind me, and we actually landed on the Ross Ice Shelf, which is when we had that trivia question about how thick it is, it is a mile thick. So the plane actually comes in and lands on that ice shelf. And it's really weird to think that you're landing on ice. This is when I first arrived down in Antarctica and the ice is very thick still and hard. As the season progresses, that top layer can actually start to melt and they will switch to a plane with skis on it so it doesn't get stuck in the, the slushiness, but it always refreezes. This is McMurdo Station. It's a, it's a small little town, but it is a very functioning town. I actually have a, a 360 video tour available on YouTube. If you look up a 360 McMurdo station tour, I completely filmed a lap around the center of town. If you want to take a, a tour yourself, it's kind of remarkable how much our station actually had. So what is it like to live on base in Antarctica? It's basically like going to college and I know a lot of you haven't been there yet but some of you have, it's, it's just like college. You have a dorm room that you share with a roommate. This is actually my dorm room at the top left hand corner. We have lounges to the right. That's how we got internet. You, there was three internet cables usually in each lounge and you had to plug in. The science wing had where we actually do our work in the lab. They had additional Wi-Fi available. It was very, very slow as more and more people got on base. And then we have the galley where it's just a giant cafeteria. Think about a fantastic food court that you've been to or a nice big buffet. You can, it's all you can eat especially for us people, our scientists that have been going out into the field, we need to eat a lot of calories to keep us energized in the field. And then there's a picture of me in our science lab. What, one of the things that actually surprised me when I was down in Antarctica was it didn't feel too cold. I currently, I'm in Massachusetts. We just came out of the winter. I actually wear a lot of the clothes that I wear in the field out in the middle of the winter here to go like snowshoeing or just on a walk outside. Or if it's just cold, I, I layer up because I have these layers now. But as you could see while I was down there, it actually got into the positive 20s in, as temperature. And that sounds so funny. But it was it was a nice warm day. It, it was we didn't have to have our giant red jackets on. We were just in a fleece jacket working. It was really nice. Uh, the coldest day we were out in the field was negative forty, and it had nasty winds that day. Uh, so it it did get really cold as well. Don't don't let uh, me fool you with the twenties, uh, especially some of you are in New Jersey. Uh, so you know what the 20s feel like, you know what negative five feels like. It's not that much worse than your coldest day on a, a typical Antarctica summer day. Um, Antarctica winter, it's a completely different story. So what did I wear? I just said it wasn't that bad every day. Uh, on a cold day, 
I wore 20 pounds of clothes. So that's my before and that's after I'm standing on a scale. I have my bunny boots on. I have my big red jacket on. I actually have five layers of pants on in that picture. And it can be hard to move. It can be hard to walk. You get used to it. Everyone falls down occasionally, but you get right back up. And I guess I find the hardest thing is the jacket was a little too long for me. Um, I'm only about 5'3", so the jacket sometimes got in my way when I was trying to move around with all those pants on or if I was trying to get on my snowmobile. We, there was actually a zipper that zips from the bottom up to make it a little bit easier to get around. So that's what I typically wore in a day. Uh, like I said, up to five layers of pants. Uh, I usually had about five layers on my upper body. Fleece was fantastic. The only thing I really want to point out here is we had no cotton on. Um, cotton can absorb sweat and you do sweat. You're moving around, uh, your body's generating heat. Um, and if you're cut, if you wear cotton, it traps your sweat and it will freeze. And that is bad for your body. So nothing we wore was made out of cotton. So a daily schedule, not that much different than maybe your school schedule. 6.30, we would wake up, we would go to the cafeteria and get breakfast, prep for our day, get everything packed. We had to pack our own lunches because we were going to be out in the field. If it was going to be a long day, I would pack ramen. We had some nice hot water with us and that was always a nice lunch treat. Uh, my snack of choice was Pop-Tarts. So just typical getting ready for work. Uh, our commute was anywhere from 45 minutes to two hours, depending on what we were taking for transportation. Once we got to the site, we took care of ourselves. A lot of times we ate lunch right away so we could work straight in the afternoon. Uh, and then we'd work from anywhere from two to six hours. And it was really important to have those snacks and bathroom breaks and to to realize when we needed to take a break. We're burning a lot of calories working in a very cold environment. And if you start to shiver, that means you need to take a break and get a snack. It took us about an hour every day to clean up from whatever we were doing. And then 45 minutes to two hours to come back to base. We, we had to refuel all our transportation, unpack, um, process any samples that we collected, try to get everything we need ready for the next day. And then we got to go eat dinner. So our two ways of commuting to our work sites every day were either by snowmobile, which went much faster, or piston bully there to the right. Uh, the piston bully topped out around eight miles per hour. The benefit of the piston bully was it was heated. <laughs> so if it was a really cold, windy day, we would all pack into that piston bully to protect ourselves from the wind and get a little bit of heat. We had two field sites. One, the first one, the top one is called Hutton Cliffs. Uh, we have what we work in is called an apple there, that little red image. And then Turtle Rock, we had an actual hut and that hut was heated. So that was always a nice break from the wind and it was nice to have heat. So where were Dell Seals? That little guy right there, he was, uh, they were named after the British, sorry, British sealing captain, James Waddell. And they are very special and why we study them is they're the southernmost breeding mammal on our planet. And they are distributed all around the Antarctica fast ice. So fast ice is what forms in the winter and then melts in the spring and summer, opening to the Ross Sea. Okay. So not that ice shelf that we land our planes on. They like to eat Antarctica cod, silverfish, squid, octopus, krill, and an adult can be 8 to 11 feet long and 900 to 1300 pounds. So their mamas were really big. 
So some quick facts, it usually takes about 35 to 52 days for a pup to wean. Uh, this is about seven weeks and they're born with this very fluffy, soft fur called Lanugo. And their mom's milk is actually super fatty, which helps them bulk up and gain weight fast. And we're gonna be looking at those numbers today. But at birth, they're about 70 pounds and they gain about four pounds a day. And so just think about that. And their mom size does decrease over the seven weeks as they're, they're taking care of their pups. I, I did notice that while we were out on the ice. So our research questions were, how does these little 70 pound pups stay warm on the Antarctica ice? And how do they develop into amazing divers? Because they are pretty amazing. So there's two thermal images there. And you can see in week one, it's uh, the image says it's about 14.9 degrees Celsius. And at week seven, that pup is at all the way up to 30.3 degrees Celsius. So it does. It, and you can see the heat is radiating off of it. Just notice the color change, right? So there's two ways the pup stays warm. Is one is that fur that I was talking about, that lanugo, and fur is really nice because it traps heat or traps air, and that air actually provides a layer of insulation. And the other is. Uh, a technique that you've probably heard a lot of other marine mammals have is blubber. So there is an actual image that we took from one of the pups. You can, it's called an ultrasound. You may have heard of it. And from your doctor's office, it's the exact same thing. You put a little gel and a little reader, and it actually shows an image of what's underneath the skin. And when blubber uh, has these small little blood vessels and when it's cold it actually they get a little bit smaller and that helps the animals not need as much energy to help stay warm so let's talk about this pup development uh week one a, a early dependency i we always saw the the pups and the mom they were feeding a lot but by week three, they were starting to get into that cold Antarctica water. It was so amazing to think about this little, little seal that's not so little anymore at three weeks, but it's still a little pup and it's starting to learn how to swim. At five weeks, it's more independent. And at seven weeks, it's fully weaned. So they nurse from their mom for about six to seven weeks. And that's just an average. Some wean for, or some nurse for a little bit more, a uh, longer time than others. So why in the field, uh, you could see the ultrasound machine there to the right. That's how we took the blubber depth. Uh, it's portable. And then when, we're working with the pups. We actually measure them at multiple points. Okay. So I put a couple lines on that pup to show you where we take our tape measure and just measure them out. So that little Waddell seal right there is just taking a nap. And so we take its curve length, that's that orange line from its nose to right where its tail starts. Um, that black arrow shows where we, we take the ultrasound machine and we measure the blubber depth. Uh, the green line, we actually go around the Waddell seal's body and measure its girth. So just think of a big tape measure around the center of your waist, okay? And then a straight length to nose is that purple line. Think about when you, you go up to a wall as straight as you possibly can. And we go from the seal's nose all the way to where its tail starts. So 
So we actually worked with 12 Waddell seal pups, but we're going to be focusing on these six. We have Mr. Goodbar, Carmelo, Smarty, Sweetheart, Charlton Chew, and Twix. Hopefully you can see a theme here. They were all named after candies. So here's some images of them growing up and they're adorable. But start to take notice about how their lanugo starts to disappear and they start to look like an adult seal at, at seven weeks old. So that's Mr. Goodbar growing up. Here's Carmelo growing up. Look at it. He was a little chubby at one week old with all his lanugo all wrinkled up there. Always next to his mom. And you can see how his lanugo in week seven started to come off in patches and still had some, but also uh, that fluffy, fluffy fur is gone in some spots. Here's Smarty. Look at week five, there's only a couple patches of that lanugo fur. Mom looks very happy in week three. Charleston Chew here started losing its lanugo in patches around three weeks old. Was always in the water around five weeks and just had a couple patches of lanugo left at seven weeks. Sweetheart. Wasn't always so sweet. Look at that wide open yawn uh, at three weeks old. And there you can see her right next to her mom at week seven. That's a great comparison to see the full grown seal versus the pup. Sorry about that. All right, so let's take a look at the seven weeks of life here. I put this in pounds, so we're talking about mass in pounds here. And so if you notice at week one, the seals range from anywhere from 80 to 112 pounds. That may be about some, the size of some of you. Oh middle schoolers that are joining us tonight um maybe uh you're about the size of a week three Waddell seal pup um i'm a, a little bit bigger than a one week old Waddell seal pup we actually practiced with me being a one week old Waddell seal pup it was a good time um and then at the week seven our largest Waddell seal pup by mass was smarty at 237 pounds. And she started off at 90 pounds at week one. So we don't work with them for the first week of life. But if you notice the blubber depth, um, now this is in inches. So they all started out with at least half an inch of blubber on their back. Um, and Charleston Chew actually won out on the blubber depth. So uh, where we had Smarty coming in at the greatest mass, uh, she was third for the, the greatest blubber depth. So one of the other things that we looked at was Lanugo. And so if you look at this image, we have that fluffy lanugo soft fur, and then we have an a molting Waddell seal pup, and that's when that that lanugo comes off in patches, and then the juvenile coat. It still has hair, okay? It's still a mammal. It has hair, but it's not that fluffy fur anymore. So as the experiment went on, we did make and record observations about how much lanugo the pups still had with them. And each one was given a quantitative number. So zero was no melting. 
one was a little bit usually losing from the head and neck and flippers at first and then it starts to go down their sides and comes off their sides of their bodies or their flanks and then if there's just a few patches of lanugo left we gave it a three and once all that baby soft fur lanugo was gone it was considered fully molted and you can see all those images right there If you're looking across Carmelo at the week of end of week seven, still had a few fur patches. So did Charleston Chew. But Sweet Tart, Mr. Goodbar, and Smarty all were fully molted by week seven, that juvenile coat. And that's just the summary. If you're trying to figure out in your head who got biggest. Who lost their fur or the Lanugo the fastest? There you go. Take a minute and take think about which one you thought was the biggest. So Charleston Chu is definitely up there, but Charleston Chu did not molt into his juvenile coat all the way. So there's two ways these pups could stay warm is by insulation and metabolic rate. That's exactly how we stay warm. Now there's a picture of me jumping on the rough ice shelf. Um, and I am fully geared up. I have all those layers. I have about 20 pounds of clothes on. That is one way I can stay warm on the ice. And the other is to make sure I take in a lot of food and put a lot of calories in my body. And that was one of the things that we're studying. We're trying to figure out the insulation versus the metabolic rate. So how do we measure metabolic rate? We have a chamber right there. And in that chamber, we can measure how much oxygen the Waddell seal pup is consuming. Right? So there's always the exact same amount of oxygen in there. It's just we can tell how much the Boydell seal pup is breathing in. And then we can use that information to convert to figure out what its metabolic rate is. And, and the important thing about that is because Waddell seal pups maintain homeostasis just like you do that, that stable body temperature. So unfortunately, because of the pandemic, I haven't been able to go to Cal Poly and analyze this data yet, but hopefully soon. And the other thing that we were investigating is how do they develop into such amazing divers? And when I say amazing divers, they can dive almost a mile down under the ice, three quarters of a mile. They can hold their breath for up to 90 minutes. Now, if you've ever watched The Little Mermaid, that would be able to hold your breath for the whole movie of The Little Mermaid. That's, that's a long time. And one really cool thing about them, okay, is think about what you're going to do if you dive under the ice into the water, right? You're going to go, oh, and then dive down. That's not what they do. They breathe everything out. They take a major exhale and then they dive. So they can't be storing their oxygen in their lungs. Okay. They actually store it in their blood and muscle. So just a little image to give you an idea how far they they dive down. If you've ever seen the Empire State Building, stack three of those on top of each other. Okay, they can dive that deep. The elephant seal, which is also um, found off the coast of California, if we have any California viewers, uh, they can uh, spend about two hours under the water. So I just talked about the fact that they breathe out before they, they dive. So 
if you look at that image, you can see that as humans, we would store about 24% of that oxygen in our lungs that we were going to keep with us underneath the water. They only start about seven and they store the rest in their muscles and cardiac system or blood. Um, and how we measure their dive behavior, we actually put time depth recorders on their tail. They didn't even notice. They're just hanging out. And what was really kind of hard is to make sure you don't lose those on the ice. They do just fall off because it's just glue. I know that was a lot of information really quick. If you want to find out more, you can check out my journal. Also, you can message me there and I can answer your questions. And the, our Growing Up on Ice team has its own website and Facebook. If you wanna reach out and learn more, okay? Is there any questions? And yeah, we did see penguins. And just a quick thank you to Rutgers, the NSF, and Arcus. Well, I'm open for questions. Thanks, Bridget. That was a really cute presentation, as well as informative, but super adorable. I love it. <laughs> um, so if you go to the Google Doc, there are a bunch of questions there. If you need the link, I can send it to you. I would appreciate it if you could just send me the link. Thank you. It says this page can't be reached. Um, but Ben's question just came up in the chat for me. So that's a really great question. Why did Caramello lose weight? So some of the Waddell seal pups started to wean faster. They stopped nursing and they actually can start to lose weight before they start to we. We didn't take any information on when they started to eat, uh, but they did, like, if a pup stops nursing, then they can start to lose weight. Were you able to get access or would you like, I can read the questions too if you want. I'm going to try one more time to copy and paste it. Oh, here we go, the copy and paste. Uh, so, what was my favorite part about being in Antarctica? I was the best scientist summer camp ever. Okay. There was so much science going on and it was so much fun all the time. If we were at lunch, we were not the only research team down there. So we just got to do science all the time, all day, every day. And I met the nicest people. I swear they just shipped them all down there. Everyone was so nice on base. Um, I would totally go back. I, I, I mean, probably not right now, not during their winter, but during the Antarctica summer season, I would totally go back. I, I would live there every year. It would be fine. Uh, the only thing I really missed was tomatoes and avocados because we don't really get fresh fruits and vegetables often. The hardest thing to adjust with the weather in Antarctica was the fact that the sun was up all the time. So it was hard to know to go to bed. You're doing a lot of work, which is helpful. So if you, you end up leaving late, you can stay out late that you don't have to worry about the sunset. It's not going to get dark on you. You have to worry about like the weather itself, but it was really hard to realize. It's 2 o'clock in the morning and you have to be up in 4 hours. It's just because it's not dark doesn't mean you need to, don't need to go to bed. A, a lot of us had like thick, thick blankets over our bedroom windows that we would close to try to like trick our body into thinking it's dark. 
I think one of the things I miss about being in Arctic Antarctica is I really liked working with the Weddell seal pups. I know they get bigger, but I, it was like definitely an adventure every day. I, snowmobiling on the ice was so much fun. Like we definitely had a good time. Um, and we played board games at night, which is, is always a good time. Uh, the coldest temperature was definitely uh, in, I think it was, it was negative 40s with 40 mile per hour winds. Uh, so to figure out that wind chill, it was a very cold, windy day. Um, we actually had fantastic weather. Uh, we go by conditions. So there was never a condition that was dangerous that we couldn't leave base. There's, there's conditions where you sometimes can't even go outside on base uh, and we didn't experience any of those days. So that was really nice about our work. And the warmest day was definitely in the twenties. I, I felt like I was, I was just in like a long sleeve and uh, one, one layer of pants. It was a very light experience for me after wearing 20 pounds of clothes a day. All right. So in the beginning, when you're starting to put this 20 pounds of of clothes on a day, it does take a while. Um, the most important thing is not to lose any layers along the way, but we got it down to, I wanna say about 10 minutes. The hardest thing to do is to remember to put on your, your bibs, your snow pants before your boots, because you have so many layers of pants on already that you kind of forget. And then if you put your boots on, you have to take them off again to put, put on that extra outer layer. How, what kind of penguins did you see? Uh, we saw two emperor penguins. And then after I left, Adele's uh, were around. The seals are not aggressive at all. Uh, they don't have any predators on the ice. So they were in the water, not during uh, birthing season. They would have orcas and leopard seals to kind of worry about. But on the ice, they have no predators and they don't, uh, humans have never been aggressive towards them. So they really don't care that we're there, which is kind of a really out of the world experience. And you could just walk up to them and they, they honestly don't care that you're there. When are the seal pups born? Uh, October ish. Um, most are born in October. And do the females have pups every season? So that would be a question that you could actually find the answer to from the Bravo 009 team. They record which seals have pups each year. Uh, which is a really cool like lineage thing if you're into that. Uh, how did I get uh, it involved with Polar Trek? Uh, Polar Trek is just an amazing program. I found it because I was interested in learning more about Antarctica because it was one of my weaker points in teaching that I didn't know about and I wanted to learn more. So I found this program and there's an application process and you apply and it, the applications get narrower and narrower and then they usually give three or four applicants to each research team and the research team actually gets to interview you and pick which teacher or educator because uh, you don't have to be a teacher you can be a like a, maybe you work at a museum and or a a camp, an informal educator is allowed to apply to. And it's a really great program to check out if you're interested. Lifespan of seals. I want to say they live up to 30 years. Pretty sure. So uh, somebody just asked, do you reapply? Uh, you can reapply. Uh, there's a couple educators that have gone multiple times. Usually people just go once, um, but 
be like when you are in an experience like that, you stay in contact with your research team. I met so many researchers and we're in constant contact. Uh, Facebook is definitely a great venue for staying in contact with all these different researchers and just reaching out. Even if I just have a question of, or my students will come up with a question that I don't know the answer to. And I'm like, oh, I know a research team for that one. And I, I usually, you know, within the week, I have an answer for them from one of these amazing people. So what species of seals was I studying? Wood Dell. Um, how many species are there in Antarctica? There are a lot of species in Antarctica. There are, the, the food web is very vast. Um, I can't answer that question. I, I don't know if any research team is actually investigating this question per se. Is climate change affecting the lifestyles of these animals? I don't know. I don't think anyone's uh, have published information exactly on that question. I know the melting sea ice, you know, the, if, if the pup is with their mom and the sea ice isn't going to be there for seven weeks anymore, that would be an issue for them in the future. Um, you think seals consume more or less oxygen than humans? That is a really good question because you're right. I haven't analyzed any data yet. My guess would be more because they're trying to stay warm where I had a lot of clothes on. They didn't have that nice special feature, but they do have blubber. So it's really hard to say because they were so much bigger than me, even with all my clothes on. It's a hard call right there. I think that, oh, I think we answered all of these questions. If anyone had anything else, the natural predators, uh, orcas, leopard seals, uh, they can get into fights with other Waddells. Thank you so much, Bridget. Um, I think you answered all of the questions. That was really great. Um, and thank you again, and thank you to our audience for joining us for our late night today. Yeah, thank um, you, everyone. Yeah, and thanks. Um, and don't forget to join us for our next virtual event, which will be on Friday, April 23rd at 1 p.m. And we will have Dr. Elizabeth Padilla Crespo. She's a distinguished research professor at the Inter-American University of Puerto Rico at Aguadilla, and she will be talking about microbes, the unseen majority. And so that is our next virtual event on April 23rd. And our next late night event will be next month. Um, that will be on May 5th on Wednesday, and it'll be about virtual meteorites. And um, Julianne Gross will be talking about her experience also in Antarctica. So you'll get to hear more about that, um, but from a different aspect since she was looking for meteorites. Um, so again, Bridget, thank you so much. Um, it was wonderful having you and have a great rest of your evening.